So we'll be continuing here with uh, uh, Dr. Paris at table before me, looking specifically at, uh, at edible wild plants that are available uh, in the wild and different ways um, that they can be used for food. Um, and because they are, are wild plants, um, they also tend to have um, medicinal benefits as well. So we may talk about some of those things in addition to their edibility. Um, but whenever you navigate a health challenge, just make sure you're, you're um, uh, enlisting the help of a, a healthcare provider who has a similar philosophy of care that you do um, so that you don't run across purposes to each other. And uh, the information here is educational um, and should be um, looked at specifically uh, and um, you know, do your own diligence to make sure that uh, it will be right for you uh, if you choose to use it. So looking at the, the wild edible that we have tonight, we're gonna to be talking about a couple of different things um, within this particular uh, family of, of uh, edibles. There's a number of different plants that also fall in the same category. So we're gonna talk about blackberries to start with, but some other berries of a similar, of a similar nature as well. So this is in the Rubus species group of plants. Uh, and we're very common with the Himalayan blackberry. That's the common blackberry that tends to overtake the hedgerows and places that aren't uh, taken care of. Um, the other one that is common is also non-native, the evergreen has a more toothed leaf here. The berries come on a little bit later in the season and are a little tartar than the Himalayan. The Himalayan are great eating berries, especially nothing like a great sun warmed uh, Himalayan blackberry uh, for, for taste and just eat them by the handful. Uh, <clears throat> the blossoms of both are very nice. Blackberry honey is amazing. Um, our blackberries are just getting ready to blossom out. Uh, <clears throat> so we've been kind of watching, watching them kind of in conjunction with our bees. Uh, and then we have our native trailing blackberry down here at the bottom. So the native tra trailing blackberry is a much milder, subtler cousin of the others, uh, much less prolific. Uh, it's more trailing and viney, small thin vines, small flowers, and small berries, but uh, very, very tasty uh, berries. Nice uh, wild edible fare. Uh, not that the Himalayan aren't wild uh, because they have gone, gone native essentially and escaped into the wild for sure and uh, tend to overtake the places where they, <clears throat> where they tend to grow. Uh, but the good news is that not only are the berries edible, but actually the entire plant is, is edible. Um, so you can eat the, uh, the leaves, the stems, the berries, the flowers, um, they're, all, they're all edible. Just as a reminder, of course, they have thorns. And it's interesting that the thorns tend to, when you go berry picking, the, the thorns tend to make it easy to go into them because they're kind of pointed inward in the bush, but going out is, is more difficult um, and very, difficult to get out, which is which is interesting. It kind of reminds me of, of the way uh, sin is. Sin has a tendency to be easy to get into, but hard to back out of. Um, someone also postulated that the blackberry thorn arrangement may be helpful in helping them climb across great spans of distance, because sometimes they can do that. <clears throat> so the, the picture here of the blackberry on the upper right is a shoot that's just coming up. Um, the, the shoots can be, can be eaten. Um, the wilting leaves, you shouldn't eat them because during that wilting period of time, there's some chemical reactions that take place that can cause stomach upset. Fresh leaves, you just pick them right off the plant and uh, use them right away, are fine. Um, or dry them, pulverize them, or powder them, and they're fine. But in the wilting stage, uh, they can have some, some uh, upset stomach uh, causal action. So in the same family, we have other berries um, and you can eat their flowers and, and their greens as well. So we have thimbleberry on the lower left, nice big uh, blossoms with a maple -like, leaf like looking leaf. You can see the thimbleberries there both unripe and ripe on the left two uh, frames. And then we have a very common uh, salmon berry, a native, a native berry. Um, it comes in a multiple of colors. The most common is probably the, the kind of orange one there, but it also comes in red and they're both, both salmon berries and they can be found in the same stand, not necessarily in the same bush, but in the same stand, they'll have uh, different uh, color qualities of, of the salmon berry. It tends to be a little seedier, a little juicier, um, not quite as flavorful, but still uh, very edible and a, a, a sought after <clears throat> food. 
And then we have raspberries. Uh, typically, uh, the raspberry is a, is a cultivated uh, raspberry, but you may find them wild as well. Just mention them because they are very common, um, not necessarily wild, but uh, it could be, could be wild and have some benefits. So the benefits that we see typically uh, are across the board for these uh, different species here. So some of the nutritional highlights of vitamin C, uh, they're very high in vitamins A and C. Uh, they have a high phenolic acid uh, content, and this is a, a powerful antioxidant with known anti-cancer activity. Um, Sababu et al. in 2015 in the Advances in Pharmacological and Pharmaceutical Sciences uh, paper noted that the antioxidant, antioxidant activities of phenolic acids or PAs are extensively implemented in the food industry as preservatives ever since antiquity. They also function in a, in a plethora of important biological activities such as anti-aging, reducing the risk of life-threatening diseases such as HIV, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and cancer. Um, this is a review paper looking at some of the different benefits, uh, therapeutic benefits of, of phenolic acid as an extract. But if you can find that actually in its, in its uh, <clears throat> native form and consume it as a, as a food or as a, in a um, medicinal way, it uh, has a more uh, modulated effect than having it singled out. Also a synergistic way, because when you extract chemical constituents out of their uh, biological habitat, so to speak, <clears throat> there may be other compounds that they work beneficially in synchrony with or synergistically with that they don't bioactively work in the same way when they're isolated or created uh, in the lab. In fact, there are some molecules that have uh, left-handed and right-handed functions. They're essentially mirror images of each other. Uh, there is a bioactive form that functions positively in nature, uh, but often when it's uh, attempted to be synthesized, it has a, an un- uh, um, reliable uh, ratio distribution of being left or right-handed and the one-handed, um, right or left-hand, depending on which one's bioactive in, in nature or in the human body, the other form is not positively bioactive and can actually be um, detrimental. And so that's one of the difficulties in creating pharmaceutical grade um, compounds is the, the biological uh, mirroring that takes place called uh, geometric isomers. <clears throat> so it's best to get it in a whole food plant form, any of these chemicals, uh, just because they work synergistically with the way that God made them, the way that he designed them to work in the plant as well as in the human body um, that consumes them. So some of the ways to eat blackberries, uh, you can eat the leaves as tea. So just pick those leaves and dry them or eat them right away fresh. Again, don't use them wilting because uh, they have some some... Degradation, act, degradation activity that can cause stomach upset. The berries, of course, everybody knows you can eat the berries, uh, fresh, frozen or dried, so you can use them in jams and jellies, pies, etc. But you can also eat the shoots. So in the spring, as those shoots are coming up, it's the new growth that'll be there for the next year. It'll be the, the fruiting growth for next year, but it can get excessive. They can just grow excessively. Um, but because they're putting so much energy into those shoots, there's actually a lot of uh, nutrients there too. So those shoots can be eaten like asparagus, just cut them off. They're usually quite soft. The thorns are not hard yet. You could even just uh, kind of peel them off uh, <clears throat> and they can be eaten uh, quite favorably. Many times the shoots from the different types of berries will have a slight berry taste to them, such as similar to the berry that they um, produce when they fruit, which is interesting which means that they must have within their phloem, uh, which is part of the plant blood, so to speak, the, the, um, the compounds that wind up in the berry at some point uh, during fruiting. So sometimes you can get a hold of those uh, leaves or shoots that are a bit uh, bitter, uh, have a very strong astringent um, action to them, um, but that is, is based on the location of where they grow. So if you have a poor experience the first time, don't be afraid to try it again. There may be a soil type uh, difference or a nutrient availability issue that lends itself to the, the taste differential. So some medicinal uh, benefits. Uh, so they're excellent for diarrhea and dysentery, uh, good for internal uh, bleeding. So you can use the roots and the leaves of the, the blackberry. Uh, they have a tonic and an astringent uh, function. So a tonic is basically just a general overall health improving um, component. Uh, 
Um, and astringent is uh, something that's going to be uh, contracting blood vessels and good for, for bleeding, for example. Um, in fact, it's noted here for internal and external bleeding. There, um, if, if it's in a tincture form, there's very high tannins associated with the tincture. A tincture is a concentrated form uh, <clears throat> that's made and you wanna only use that for like a week at a time because of that high tannin content. You can use uh, just the, the regular um, uh, whole food form, i.e. just the leaves off the tree, not the tree, but the, the blackberry or the dried leaves um, more consistently because the tannins aren't gonna be as concentrated. They'll still be present, but just not in as concentrated a form as in the tincture. So red raspberries actually have their own benefits um, in the leaves and the berries in particular. Um, the leaves have uh, an anti-emetic property. So a tea from the leaves can be helpful in, in reducing um, nausea and vomiting. Uh, again, it helps in, in cutting off or stopping bleeding, um, has some laxative effects, and also promotes appetite. So this can be good uh, for someone who has appetite loss for whatever reason, illness, or some other reason. Um, actually, it's also used quite extensively for um, aiding childbirth, both pre and uh, post childbirth. Uh, it aids in post parturition um, bleeding reduction and healing, uh, and also the pain that's associated with childbirth that can be helpful. It uh, again has a tonic effect, um, is a, a mild stimulant, and an alterative. So, an alterative is something that would be alterating or altering the state towards health. Um, an alterative never um, moves towards disease, but actually kind of functions, functions along the line of a tonic. The fruit can have laxative um, effects, probably if eaten in, in too high of a quantity. Actually, it's interesting that raspberries are the highest fiber fruit that are out there. <clears throat> um, so they're very beneficial as far as uh, a fiber source and hence their laxative effect. Uh, again, of course, they're edible uh, and they can actually uh, function as an anti-acid, not ant, an anti-acid. And um, again, uh, the, the um, as a child birth aid, a, a periurient, there you go, periurient. I think there's a T missing there. Uh, so it's gonna be functioning to, to help reduce the pain and ease the, um, the child birthing process. So that's red raspberries. Um, and that's good to know um, if you're in the field and have, uh, have need of that without having other things available. So it actually benefits uh, things like canker sores and mucous membranes. So no food during this time, only juices until those things heal up. Um, but while you do that, you can use the, um, the tea. So a cup of tea every hour until the canker sore resolves. And canker sores can be very, very annoying in the lip um, or on the tongue. I remember getting them as a kid, haven't had it for years. Um, and I don't know, really know what the basis of canker sores are. It's not, uh, it's not like a herpes or anything like that because that's a different kind of a breakout on the lips. Um, but the raspberry tea uh, is made from an ounce of dried leaves or a handful of fresh leaves. So a handful of fresh or one ounce of dried. Into a pint of boiling water, steep that for uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So it's a pretty good steep time. And strain and drink it and uh, use one to two cups a day uh, on a normal basis if you're up there working on those canker sores, then a cup of tea every hour until it goes away. It does have a, kind of an astringent bitter taste um, occasionally, so that honey uh, is an optional uh, sweetening agent to make it more palatable. So again, it can, can help in childbirthing by easing the pain associated with it and just helping it along. It's not like um, some drugs, there's uh, like Oxycontin, I think it is, that um, can be a very uh, powerful, uh, smooth muscle stimulant that can actually uh, overdo the birthing process, but sometimes is given to help aid it along. Uh, but this uh, the red, red raspberry um, is gonna be much more um, slow moving and yet faster than just the natural process on its own. So again, it's anti-nausea, um, toning the uterine muscles. It actually helps reduce miscarriages. Uh, and again, good for uh, postpartum use. It slowly decreases um, menstrual flow. So part of that, that postpartum use is the fact that uh, there can be some bleeding associated with, with uh, 
um, uterine um, and placental separation. Uh, so that is helpful in, in reducing that. So if you're using it uh, during pregnancy, only use it after the third month of pregnancy. Um, there was no indication as to why that was per se, but after the third month is when you would, would want to start incorporating that if you had issues with nausea. And then later on, as you're getting, getting close to delivery and you need to turn up those ear muscles. So it's very soothing and non-stimulating, mean it, meaning that it's um, it has not a high level of stimulation, like for example, Oxycontin. Um, <clears throat> so it eases nausea again, and you can use that raspberry tea to replace tea or coffee if you um, need, need a hot drink. In fact, it has much superior uh, overall tonic uh, properties as compared to tea or coffee, which have, in addition to caffeine, other constituents that, while maybe touted in some circles as being antioxidant in nature, um, come along with other things that you don't want to have with them. It's kind of like... Um, putting sugar on ants and, and calling them good or chocolate covered um, grasshoppers or something like that. Uh, so it's also excellent for uh, children that have gastrointestinal intestinal issues. It uh, eases it along, um, eases it along well for them. The diarrhea, uh, it's very helpful for um, using a, a decoction of the leaf um, or raspberry vinegar. For, for diarrhea, high blood pressure, because you can aid in lowering the blood pressure by toning the circulatory system. Um, essentially, that's the astringent activity causing the smooth muscle to um, function appro appropriately. Um, and astringent typically is a constriction of the, of the blood vessels, um, but overall, the tonic effect is gonna be an overall effect of, of lowering blood pressure. Helpful for lesions, wounds, or other minor skin infections, use the T. Uh, as a wash for itchy skin, wounds, or bites. Um, found uh, um, one, of the, one of the authors that I was uh, looking at today uh, was in the tropics and contracted a, a bug that uh, caused a fever and uh, was having a hard time with it. Um, he was kind of more in the natural realm, but uh, had um, found that you know, the ibuprofen that he took was something he rarely ate or used. Uh, kind of helped a little bit, but not like he wanted to. Uh, and then had his, uh, had his mom go get some berries and uh, um, he drank a bunch of raspberry tea, very hot, concentrated and that helped uh, in just a couple of days was gone and never saw it again. So it can be helpful in that regard. So it mentioned raspberry vinegar. Here's a recipe for making raspberry vinegar. Take two cups of apple cider vinegar, so that's your vinegar base, eight ounces of red raspberries, and eight ounces of brown sugar or raw honey. So again, this is, <clears throat> this is using the, the raspberry, red raspberry um, as the recipe for this. Um, <clears throat> crush those raspberries and add vinegar and then steep it for 10 days. So it's just, just basically gonna be soaking in that vinegar for, for up to 10 days. Then strain those raspberries out uh, and bring the mixture to a, 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 a boil, a simmer, till it all dissolves. And then you can uh, store that in, uh, in a cool, uh, dark place in the, in the dark. Um, use undiluted or diluted um, two tablespoons three times a day when you use it. So you can stretch it out by diluting it a little bit, cutting it, um, or just use it uh, straight. So now we're gonna jump to a tree. So believe it or not, there are trees that are edible, have edible portions of them as well. Um, <clears throat> they're typically not a staple in the food realm, um, although they can be used that way. One of the, probably the most predominantly well-known tree uh, constituents is, is actually slippery elm, um, but there's other ones available, including one that we have natively. Slippery elm is not native to, to the Northwest, um, but the red alder is very common here. So in the background, you can see a nice tall stand of red alder. Um, it can be bushy or it can be tall. Uh, <clears throat> as you go farther north, uh, like Alaska, it can be kind of shrubby and hedgy, uh, <clears throat> but it's still the same, the same tree. It's actually a pioneering species in places that have been disturbed um, and actually has nitrogen fixing qualities in the ground. So it helps prepare the way for other um, trees of different uh, nitrogen requirements to follow along. So you can see it's kind of a cone-bearing uh, deciduous tree, 
it doesn't have cones per se, but there are some cones here. These are last year's cones. Over here on the left, you see a last year cone, the current year cone, and then the catkins. So as the male part, this is the pollen bearing uh, portion, and the female quotes cone on the same tree. Uh, and this is the catkin uh, right here. So those are the primary parts of, of the red alder. So the pollen, you can collect and use the pollen as a, a protein supplement. So here's a, a highly magnified uh, pollen grain here. Here's a catkin that's been bumped and the pollen is spewing out everywhere. If you take a bunch of those, kind of like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, taking cattail and, and collecting their pollen, um, you could collect that pollen and, and use it uh, um, to eat as a protein supplement. The leaves, uh, so they're just coming out. So this would be a seasonal thing. You wouldn't eat the leaves later in the season, but the, the fresh tender young leaves of the red alder are, are edible. You can be used for salads or just graze, browse on them. The catkins and buds can be eaten raw um, or in salads. So these are the catkins here, probably in the stage before they get to pollen release, um, back in the more green stage um, before they start uh, letting their pollen out into the air. And the buds would be the buds of the budding, um, the budding leaf buds. The inner bark, um, essentially known as the vascular cambium of the red alder is, is very sweet and tasty. It's uh, uh, harvested in the springtime. And when you harvest it, you wanna do it from the branches, the lateral branches versus the trunk. If you do it from the trunk, you can end up girdling it and actually causing it to, um, causing it to die perhaps. <clears throat> uh, actually, that's what will happen if you girdle it. Uh, so use the trunk or the, the lateral branches instead of the, the trunk itself um, to, um, to harvest the vascular cambium from. So that can be powdered and used as flour or for thickening in soups and sauces. So the sap is actually sweet in flavor as well. And that would be collected in the late winter um, and eat, eat that raw. So unlike sap from a maple tree, which is uh, simmered down and concentrated, um, and preserve for a long period of time, uh, you would want to drink this or eat this uh, right away, but it can be beneficial that way. Can aid in uh, stomach ache uh, relief, as well as having anti-inflammatory and astringent uh, properties associated with it. So we can eat tree components as well, which is, which is helpful because sometimes there may be more trees than other things, especially at uh, various times of the year. So one of the components of the bark that gives it some medicinal properties is salicin. And salicin is also present in willow and it's uh, the, um, one of the main constituents of uh, where they derive aspirin from. So it has uh, uh, pain relieving qualities. Um, so it can help break fevers, um, uh, arthritic and headache pain. Uh, you can see the bark is very red here when scraped away uh, and hence it's called red alder. Um, also can be helpful for skin conditions like eczema, uh, poison oak or ivy. Uh, use a, a bark infusion. So a bark infusion or poultice on the skin. So you'd scrape the bark, the fresh bark, the cambium. And so it's not the outer gray portion, but the red portion and under uh, that you'd be using uh, for, for the poultice or the infusion. Now remember an infusion is just simply a tea. So you would take that shredded um, inner bark and put it in an infusing ball um, and put it into your, your mug and cover it with, with boiling water and let it steep. You use, as a, use that as a wash to soothe it um, and reduce inflammation and, and swelling. So again, it has that uh, analgesic uh, quality associated with it. Interestingly enough, the, the inner bark is helpful for uh, getting rid of, of scabies, mites, and lice, um, and also, also noted for fleas. Uh, so you boil the inner bark and leaves in vinegar, uh, let that cool, massage into the affected area and it just uh, eliminates and kills them. Um, in fact, I think it was Culpepper was noted as uh, having uh, stated that taking the alder leaf, a branch of alder leaves with the morning dew still upon it, if there are fleas in the bedchamber, taking it in and it will attract them to them and you can rid your uh, room of fleas. So that's uh, interesting, haven't tried that one yet, but it's good to know about those types of things. <clears throat> Then also some respiratory conditions like TB, um, a, a decoction of the red alder can be used. So decoction is similar to um, an infusion, only it's a larger, um, more dense components that are steeped for a longer period of time. Uh, so tuberculosis, lymphatic issues, also helpful in syphilis. 
So use only the, the dry bark um, when you're using it internally. Externally, um, you can just, uh, you can use that as a poultice, for example. Um, but if you're gonna be using it uh, internally, you wanna use it dry. Um, it can cause vomiting or upset stomach if, if used fresh. So make sure that you collect it ahead of time and have it uh, set aside in a dry fashion for internal use. So making a red alder decoction, you would use one ounce of dried red alder bark and one pint or two cups of water. So decoction again is a longer term um, extraction process than an infusion. So you would crush or grind that bark into small pieces. Um, and then in a non-reactive pot, so like stainless steel, for example, uh, simmer it until you reduce the, the volume by a quarter to a third. So the leftover should be one and a third to one and a half cups of, um, of fluid. So you're gonna simmer that and it's gonna evaporate away and just need to pay attention to your volumes. And as it gets down, it'll become more concentrated. So you can refrigerate that up to three days, um, just cool it and strain it before use. And that makes an excellent gargle for sore throats.